I'd like to talk about something different today, which is a little bit about um, what nature can teach us about information systems and what nature can teach us about computing. I kind of think of it as biomimicry for the pervasive computing age. There's this explosion of information happening, and it's really exponential. It's, it's huge. Um, the chief scientist from Amazon recently said that the amount of information we generated in 2009 is equal to the amount of information we generated from the dawn of mankind up to 2008. So we're really making a lot of information. And in fact, the cost of smart devices has dropped. Uh, the semiconductor industry now says that we make more transistors than grains of rice, and we make them cheaper. So it is just dirt cheap to have trillions of things connected. And in fact, that's what most analysts predict we're going to have. If you were to go back in time, you know, through the history of, of man-made computing, what you would find out, maybe back around 1900, is you'd find out that computing was a career. If you tabulated numbers, you were called a computer. That was what computers were, it was a job. Now, if you were to flash forward in time, maybe, maybe zip all the way up to 1945, we were in a massive world war, and computers turned out to be these giant calculators. It was really computing as calculators, they were huge, they were used to, to solve cryptographic problems, to try to break the enemy code, to try to win a war. And um, this was kind of a small hill of computing. You know, there were, there were maybe four or five. They actually had names like Colossus because they were the size of buildings. Um, and, and the chairman of IBM actually in 1950 said, he thinks there's a worldwide market for four or, or five computers. <laughs> but this was really, they literally were just, they were taking the form of the normal computers, which were people, and they called them electronic computers. They named them after the career. So a small hill, we had maybe four or five in the whole world. Now, if you were to flash forward maybe to the 1970s and maybe the 1980s and really all the way up to today, you'd actually find something different. We've actually built this huge mountain of information systems and computers. And, and this is a place where you kind of look into a computer and you see a place, you see a, a folders and you see trash cans and, and, and you see your sort of desktop in there. And, and so it's computing as a place that you look into and all the information's in there, all your stuff is piled up in bookcases inside of your computer and file folders. This was a big deal. And in fact, when we got to the top of this mountain, and that's the mountain we're on right now, we ended up getting to the point where we had one billion internet users. And in fact, I think we're, we're now close to one and a half billion or two billion internet users. That's a huge amount of people and things using the internet. It's, it's just unbelievable and boggling. But it turns out that when we got to the top of this mountain, we found out that there was a much bigger mountain ahead. And I'll call that the trillion node mountain. This is this idea, and most analysts are saying it's going to happen within the next five years, that there will be trillions of semi, sometimes always connected devices that are all going to be communicating. What we've got to do is we've got to learn the tools and begin to climb the trillion node mountain. I mean, it's a big deal, but there's a lot of space up there. So this is a really interesting place to be in the future. Now, the reality is we haven't solved trillions. We, we haven't even come close. Um, but a wise man once said, if you really want to do something hard, find someone else who's done something like that and study them. And so it turns out that even though we haven't done anything in the scale of trillions, nature has. You know, nature, our bodies are computing systems in our own right. We've got trillions of cells in our bodies, every one of us. And if you look closely, you find atoms, and those atoms make up molecules, and the molecules make up cells, and then the cells make up organs, and then the organs make up systems, and then those systems make up me. And then you and I together, that makes up us. And all together, we make up communities. So that pattern right there, that's a design pattern that nature uses to cope with all that complexity. And that pattern itself is something really interesting. It's called layered semantics or layered complexity. And what it really means is that the lower levels don't need to know anything about how they're going to be used at the upper levels. They form sort of stable plateaus so that you can build and make new things and have new innovations. So the atoms don't know how they're put together as molecules. The molecules don't know how they're going to be put together into DNA or into cells or into you and I. They just do their business. And that complexity, simple things building more complex things, is the way that nature works. Physics. That kind of gives us the platform for the whole universe. And what we find at physics is really interesting. We actually find this thing called universal identity. No two atoms can exist in the same place at the same time. That's something called Pauli's exclusion principle. It's really nice because you actually know the identity of every atom, 
you know, they, they, they can't exist in the same place at the same time, which means that when you and I are talking about a can of cola, we know we're talking about the same thing. There aren't two cans of colas that can exist in the same place. So you and I can collaborate. You and I can talk about the information about that can of cola. But we get into problems when we talk about more abstract things. Like if I were to say something like Moby Dick, what do I mean? That's kind of abstract. It doesn't have a unique identity. Do I mean this book? Do I mean all the books called Moby Dick? Do I mean the idea of Moby Dick, the pattern of Moby Dick? Many arguments that happen in this world are really about confusion around identity. Now, some smart researchers have come up with a way to solve this. This is a universally unique identity. What it really means is in mathematics, if you generate a really big number, you're pretty much guaranteed that it's unique in the entire universe. So that's a number right there. That's big enough to be unique in the entire universe. There's a pretty good probability that there's no other number like it. So that's called a UU idea, universally unique identity. And it helps us do things that atoms do in nature and kind of copy that design pattern. We could also kind of go up, you know, we could look at chemistry. And I'm not going to really talk too much about chemistry, but there's this wonderful thing in chemistry called the periodic table. What you find there is this architecture. Mendeleev, back in 1866, laid out how all the atoms would work, all the elements. And he predicted where all the future elements would fall because he was able to find the constants and the variables, this sort of architecture, architecture with a capital A. All the things, the sort of blueprint of the way nature works, and that has allowed us to build amazing things. If you look at this chart, the gray ones were discovered back in the 1800s. Um, the green ones a little later, the purple ones a little later, the blue ones actually pretty recently. So he was able to use architecture to future-proof and predict stuff that was going to happen 100 years in the future or more, actually more than 100 years, 150 years in the future. So architecture with a capital A turns out to be a really interesting pattern. But I'm going to keep moving because I think when we get up one more level, it gets exciting. At this level, we start to see some really exciting innovation and evolution and all sorts of things. And the first thing I want to talk about is something called containerization. It turns out that DNA is a container for all of life's information, pretty much all of life's information. If you've got the DNA, you can recapitulate a person. And it's a container for genes. It actually holds genes. It turns out it's got universally unique identity. It's made of atoms. Um, it holds a bunch of genes. And on top of that, this container is interesting in that it can be mutated. It's mutable and, and it's extensible, which means you can glue new genes in and you can take old genes out of this container but you could still treat it like a normal container. It's a container to kind of shuffle things around. This is a little abstract, so it's actually nice to look at other complex systems that have the same kind of thing. And in fact, we find this in all ultrascale complex systems. So let's look at the worldwide commerce system. You know, um, Thomas Friedman came out with a book called The World is Flat. This is one of the things that actually flattened the world. It's called a shipping container. It's not very exciting, um, but it turns out that this is a standardized container, and we haven't had it for always. We, we've only had it for a brief period of time for shipping around goods. And it's got a unique identity, and it's mutable. You can change stuff out inside, and you actually don't need to know much about what's inside of it to do things with it. In fact, before the shipping container, and most of us don't remember this, um, there wasn't much worldwide commerce. It was just too expensive. It was way too complicated. You had to pay longshoremen to basically load up stuff in nets and put it in the, into boats. And you had to make sure not to put like the bananas underneath the, the net full of anvils. That would be bad, right? So, so you had to do all this. So it turned out there was really no worldwide commerce. But then this idea came up, this idea of a standardized container that could be used for everything. And people were able to make ships and boats and cranes and trucks. And all they needed to know was the dimensions of that container. They didn't know anything else. And each one of those could decide whether they could open it up and do something with that information, just the same way that cells do this. Now, Containerization is just one piece of it. It turns out the containers have to kind of act as a liquid currency. And so you can't really get very far with a barter, barter economy, you know, when you're trading like um, a lamb for textile or fabric or something like that. You really can't get very far. And it turns out it's because you can't separate the value from the actual item. So barter economies don't really scale. But it turns out that when we agreed on a liquid currency, the entire worldwide commerce engine started flowing. Um, this turned out to be uh, pretty significant, and it's, a it's called a liquid currency, and some of the things I talk about are going to sound kind of economic because, of, because economics is one of those complex systems. The question might be, do we have anything like this on the web? You know, do we have a liquid currency? Do we have anything like that? I'll actually say, no, we don't, and it's one of those things that does keep me up at night. We actually have this amazing set of 
currencies down at the low level. Digital computing actually uses something called the bit and the byte. Right above that, the internet, which isn't the web, uses something called the packet. These are actually incredibly well designed, so well designed that they kind of let the web masquerade as a pretty good structure. But it turns out it doesn't. It doesn't work. And it actually isn't something that we're going to build a trillion node network on. It's probably going to atrophy and, and disappear as other things come up. I'm not going to talk too much about P2P, but it turns out that peer-to-peer -peer is, a, is, a, is a design pattern that we find in nature. You guys might have heard of peer-to-peer -peer because of Napster, um, you know, file sharing, and people got really upset by it. But we have to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It turns out that peer-to-peer -peer is really important for just about every complex system. That's how we scale. That's how we actually gain resiliency. It's actually how we store so much information and, and trade it around in our complex information systems. You know, the skin cell on my toe doesn't actually connect directly to the skin cell on my ear. Mostly, it talks to its friends, and it replicates, and it replicates promiscuously. There is enough DNA to make up me in every single cell of my body, so you can never lose any information. Now, I want to cover maybe just one more layer, and then I'm done. At some point, psychology came up because these organisms started thinking. We actually got a mind, and we could start manipulating things. We pushed against the entire world. And so, Manipulating things turns out to be something we are very good at. Object-centricness. We pick up objects, we know when they fall, we know that they won't pass right through things, that they'll stop, we know gravity works. There's a, there's a really predictable trust level that we have with objects. We're very good at them. I want to show um, something from our labs. So I'm going to take universal identity, architecture, peer-to-peer, -peer, liquid containers and DNA, so digital DNA, and direct manipulation. What if you could actually just pick up bars off a of bar chart and treat it like an object? And if you dump it on, map, on a map, and if it's got mappiness, it just shows up. So that we can use the things that we've learned to actually manipulate the information as it starts exploding around us. Here's an example in the digital space. So this is in our little Petri dish. This data is about Napoleon battling towards Russia. It's sort of a classic data set. And you can see those battles are the battles that he fought as he was marching towards Russia. And so this is a little container that just has that. And I can pull that container out and actually look at it in different ways, and you can see those dots are just a different way of rendering that information. So I'm going to do something different, though. I'm just going to pick up this information. Those are those battles. And I'm going to just drag it right in to a different little organism. And this organism is actually a list and a table organism. It lets me look at things differently. So I drag it into there, and I start tuning it a bit. I say, What's, what are the members of this of this container. Can I open up the container and look at it? So I'm looking at the container, and what do I see? I see the battles. There they are, right? And I can see the French commander. I can see the day the battle happened. So by manipulating the information, the single same currency but using different organisms, I can do different things. So let's try something out with this. You know, this is what, um, this is sort of a classic visualization of Napoleon's battle towards Russia. Let's try to make that, but I'm not going to write any code. I'm just going to do direct manipulation. I'm just going to pick stuff up and build a brand new organism. 